So, welcome to the second boot camp. Um, unlike yesterday, I don't have um, like slides prepared. Um, um, but the idea of today and tomorrow is to focus on a course called uh, What They Forgot to Teach You About R. Um, and this is really a lot about like um, file organization and using R Studio, um, and learning about R Studio projects, learning about GitHub. And so a lot of us already use uh, uh, these components, but um, it will be good to refresh them and also, and also to have access to a common um, set of, uh, of references that we can um, um, help people to check um, and that we will be able to guide them on later on. So what they forgot to teach you about R, um, there's a website um, which is rstats.wtf, which I find really hilarious. That does the acronym that they chose. Um, um, and so this website is actually under construction. Um, it's also a book down website. So I imagine in the future, this will be a book. Um, and it was initially, um, uh, like the two people that, um, have been in charge uh, for what they forgot to teach about are, are Jenny Bryan, uh, who is an R student employee and is also uh, a professor in, uh, in Canada, um, University of British Columbia, I, I believe. Um, and then Jim Hester. Jim Hester is like a software engineer who works at our studio and pre previously worked at Bioconductor. Um, and I mean, they're both great people. If you ever have the opportunity to meet them in person, um, I'll try to introduce them to you. Um, and so this book, um, is under construction parts of like some of the chapters are like uh, uh, just like um, you know, notes towards themselves of saying like oh we need to do this later um, but um, if I go back to the beginning um, um, but uh, they teach this as a set of workshops as two-day workshops and the latest version was the one they taught at the R Studio Conference 2020. And so I actually have the link on the set of resources here. Um, so I'll send you guys this link. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, so this will be the main website that we'll be using in the next couple of days. So I'll send it to you through the chat. Um, Zoom chat. Okay. Um, so, all right. So, um, you know, we don't have two days. You know, we only have like four hours between today and tomorrow. Um, so we won't get to cover everything. Um, but uh, let's start with the project oriented workflow uh, from Monday. Um, so this is day one. Um, and so there's all of these pages have like, uh, link to slides, um, link to some things they were asking people to complete on. So for example, they wanted to know what was the operating system people were working on. Uh, but I mean that, the, the two sections that we are gonna focus the most are the slides and the resources. The resources in particular here are, are uh, links that they mentioned during the slides uh, that we might actually want to spend more time looking more closely at. So for example, this is a paper um, that is maybe like 15 pages long or so that we could, uh, you know, at some point maybe one of you would like to present for our journal club. Um, um, okay, so um, I'm only gonna op open the, the WTF opening uh, 
slides just because it has pictures of the people um, uh, behind this. And so um, uh, this particular workshop at our studio conference 2020 um, is, was also a little bit of the changing of the guard because we have Jenny Bryan here on the left with Jim Hester and Kara Wu, who is, um, um, she works at a company called Sage Bio Networks in Seattle um, and was an art student intern. She was one uh, of the teachers of this workshop at our studio conference. Um, um, okay, so these are the people behind, you know, the material that we'll be using. Um, and they're all, they're, all three of them are active on Twitter. Um, okay, so project-oriented workflow. Uh, let me actually download these slides so I can um, look through them more nicely. Um, So, I am. So, I mean, we're able to use this because it's um, share alike, right? So, that's one of the nice things about our senior. They make uh, a lot of their education material uh, access accessible by us. Um, all right. So, the idea is that um, uh, sometimes, you know, people tell you, like, okay, uh, we taught you how to use R, you're ready to work in data science, right? The problem is that they forget to tell you that statistical analysis is just a small portion of the, everything else that we do. Um, actually, have any of you seen Josh? Oh, he's here. Oh, I haven't seen you, Josh. All right. um, um, I don't know, let me make sure. I'm not seeing all of your cameras. Let's change that. Okay, cool. Um, just in case I can see you guys raising your hand or something. <laughs> um, okay, so that the problem is like we, you know, we get trained to use R and like explore data and stuff, and we think that's all we need to do. But there's a lot of stuff extra, and actually some of the meetings I had with some of you today were about the extra stuff, about organizing files, about how to have a clean workflow. And so um, I don't actually know what were the deep thoughts that were shared in this slide. I do know that this is um, Grand Teton National Park. Um, and this is the barn that has been photographed the most in the US apparently. And it's a very boring barn um, if you ever go to it. Um, um, but the idea here is like you want to be organized, right? And so this is something that we struggle a lot ourselves. So I mean, or I struggle with this sometimes, right? Um, if you want to be organized, you should do it today, not tomorrow, not tomorrow, like don't do it later when you want to clean up things. Um, and so we're going to learn through this workshop how to be organized. Um, uh, but also um, just because we learn how to be organized and like some of our past stuff is not organized, we shouldn't try to uh, try to fix everything we've done in the past, right? So the idea that they explain here is that we should just raise the bar for our new work in the future. Uh, so there's this great image here where there's like, you know, maybe this is the past on the left, this is how neatly organized it could be on the right, but doing all that organization is a lot of work, right? Um, and uh, <clears throat> you don't necessarily want to go back into that room full of cans um, and open that kind of worms type of thing. Um, so um, the idea is that like one way of being organized is that if if your files um, and your organization structure is self-explanatory then that's way better than having to explain a lot of stuff in detail through through text through prose right um, and so uh, like, I'll show you a bad example, and it's like, I mean, or not an ideal example. So, uh, like, this is a recent, recent project I did. Um, um, and, I like, here I have, um, uh, uh, I mentioned different scripts and where they are and like all the processes you need to reproduce some of the data. 
and this is a bunch of text, right? Um, but if you access those directories, it's not all like in the same directory and it's not like script number one, script number two, script number three type of thing. It's a very complicated like set of uh, directories. And so that's why I needed like this piece of text here for explaining like this is how you could do things in the future, right? Um, and that's because we were you know, trying to do that project as fast as we could type of thing. Um, and there was no time for tomorrow for organizing tomorrow. Um, um, but I mean that you know that's a past and like in the future hopefully we'll be more organized. Um, another here's a, a specific example they have, which is like you have um, a directory right for your your project. And you have a, a data folder, a figures folder, a NAR folder with a couple of your readmes and um, uh, and then an R Studio project file. That type of structure is like way better than just having a bunch of different files and an out of date readme. And so uh, I actually quite like this structure on the left, um, the idea of it, but I haven't actually implemented it myself as much. Um, and so here, like the names of the files for the R scripts, you can already see there's like 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, up to like let's say 95 or et cetera, right? And so they will be self organized by your operating system because it's going to sort the files by name and like you don't have to like have a very long readme explaining how each of the files are related to each other right um we have kind of done something like this where inside of a project folder we have some r scripts we have a pdf directory for uh, pdf files and then we have a rda directory for our data files. Uh, so we kind of do this, but uh, but like the file names for our scripts are not like, are not zero one underscore something, zero two, et cetera. They're just um, file names. And so um, unless by coincidence that uh, the alphabetical ordering of our file names matches the logical ordering of them, then, um, then it's not self-organized, right? Um, Keeping a, a README up to date is also quite um, time consuming sometimes, right? And so just having a, and this is a, a set of simple rules, um, having the data, the figures, the R folder, using uh, 0, 1, 0, 2, et cetera, for your file names, that will you know, uh, make it a, be a game changer in terms of uh, organization. Um, then uh, uh, for more details, that's where this paper uh, and this uh, good enough uh, website come into play. Uh, this good enough website is a GitHub website that is a companion to the paper. Um, from uh, the first author of this paper, um, uh, his name is his last name is Wilson. He is um, he was the, I think he's uh, one of the co-founders of uh, uh, software carpentries and data carpentries. He's also he now also works at our studio um, on education. Uh, and then Jenny Bryan is a second author. Um, um, so they've, you know, they've definitely thought about how to teach people the best way of organizing their code. Cool. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> um, part of all of this is also going to be learning about how to make our packages. And so for that, we're going to learn more about um, building tidy tools. Um, the next week, uh, but like the idea is that an R package is a natural way of distributing code. There's a lot of code out there, um, um, and I don't know if I'm going back to that slide. Right. Cool. Um, and like we already don't know how to install packages to like install the packages or re remotes. Uh, install underscore GitHub. Um, um, we already know those ways of working with packages. Um, and um, we've already edited uh, where our packages live in the past, but just to refresh that, um, they actually live on, um, we can find the path for them. I'm opening our studio here, sorry. Mm -hmm. 
uh, uh, we type dot library, that's gonna tell us where our R packages are installed. Um, there's also leap paths as a function, uh, which also gives us the library. Um, and so uh, this is something that we have configured to edit on our um, Gypsy accounts, uh, such that if we log into Gypsy, um, um, we, uh, all of us have our own like um, uh, library paths uh, based on um, um, our configuration. So this is taking a while, I don't know why. Um, I don't know if Gypsy's on uh, or not. Okay, I'll skip that. Um, so dot leap paths is the function of how we get where our packages are installed. Um, and that is used when you, we use the install.packages function uh, also. Um, that's how we can get all, all our current packages. Um, so we'll skip, they have an example here. Uh, we'll skip some of, the, of those um, um, uh, exercises that they have when exploring packages. Um, but they have a couple of large scripts here. Now, uh, that's um, uh, uh, you know, something we could do later on uh, on ourselves, basically. Um, um, all right. Um, so, why do you want to adopt a project oriented workflow? Uh, uh, you already know this, but like we are truly working on more than one thing at a time, right? Um, so, uh, we try to, go to protect people like uh, that just started. So, for example, Artha was just mostly working on TWAS, right? But, uh, and that was for one study in particular. Uh, but, uh, you know, as you gain skills, um, uh, we get asked to help people uh, on, on multiple projects. Um, so we'll definitely be working on one, more than one thing at a time. And so as a team, uh, we want to collaborate among ourselves to also be able to uh, communicate with each other. And then we need to distribute some of our code to other people outside of the groups. Um, and because we're working with one thing, more than one thing at a time, then we're going to st uh, start and stop our work multiple times um, during the weeks and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's the back, uh, you know, um, that's, uh, you know, the nature of what we do. And so um, um, we have a project oriented workflow um, that actually translates to having like a dedicated directory for every project instead of a lot of, instead of having a bunch of directories. Um, and so we just had a meeting about this uh, where for one particular um, process in the Liber data, uh, we have uh, multiple directories. And one of the things we need to do is to have a de dedicated directory for it in the future. Once you have a de dedicated directory, then we can start using our, an R Studio project for that directory. Um, and then, if we start using an R Studio project, then we can. It will be natural to also make a Git and a GitHub repository for it, and that will be the way that we can share the code and distribute the code to other people, um, and uh, collaborate with others. Um, um, Jenny Ryan will like burn your computer if you ever have like lines like this, like set WD or remove list, everything. Um, um, and so uh, one of the solutions for dealing with this is the here package, uh, which uh, I've talked about in the R Club sessions in the past. Um, all right, but uh, before we get to the here package, let's uh, just refresh our minds on what an R Studio project is. So it, it, it's a file that ends with a dot R P R A eh, R P R O J extension. Um, it's a small text file, and that text file uh, provides information to the RStudio um, uh, IDE, um, and um, it will allow us to open a specific R process for that project. 
uh, and like have a specific terminals for that project. So this is one of them, right? Where I just logged in into the cluster. Um, 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 we'll have our, uh, and like everything else that comes with RCU, right? We'll have our file browser, our working directory, all of that set to the project directory automatically. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated for us because we work with Gypsy, right? And so um, uh, that's why we spent already time uh, making sure all of us can open our CD project files from Gypsy in our computers, right? Um, all right. And so the idea is if you have on our project, you don't need to remember all the different things that come with it, right? So uh, each of them, right? Like here, let's say you have one of them that's called um, uh, blah, another one called foofy. Uh, each of them comes with a set of files associated with them, a, a Git history associated with it, a GitHub repository shared with others, and a specific R session for it. Right? So instead of having to open, let's say, eight different things, we only have to open two different things. Um, so it's a little bit of a, of a shortcut there. Now, this is something that I think not all of you have, uh, but you should. <laughs> and so um, on our studio, under the general settings, you should disable restoring the .r data file into a workspace at startup, and you should never save a workspace. Um, this is one of those things that I think will change with R in the future. Um, just like strings as factors equals false. Um, and um, the initial idea of restoring, of saving your workspace and then restoring the workspace was they wanted to make it easier for people to, to resume work um, after, like a, after a new session. But the problem is that uh, if you rely on that type of feature, then you're not making your, um, uh, your code uh, fully reproducible. And if you don't make it fully reproducible, you won't be able to get help from others. And it's actually gonna, uh, that can lead also to problems in the future for debugging code. So you wanna disable the restore data and you, will, and you want to um, never save the workspace. Um, those are some of the settings. Uh, and the idea for this is like if you run into a bug or something, you could always restart R and start from start from scratch and make sure that you're being able to reproduce that bug um, before then asking for help, right? So as a package developer, um, which you got, all of you guys will become, um, we're going to restart R often. Um, okay, so. Um, the way that you can create a project uh, is we're gonna use it. The, uh, there's the use this package, which I've also mentioned in some other sections, I think. Um, but it has a function that is very helpful called create underscore project. And after that, you can give it a path to a, di a directory. Um, and so, um, um, eh, I'm running out of air. <laughs> So, um, you know, this is something um, uh, uh, we could do if we had a bit more time, right, um, to try everything out. Um, so, like, I'm going a lot faster than, like, uh, what uh, the worship went or what I imagine it went to. Um, okay. Um, so, we're going to, you know, use our projects, our studio projects. Uh, the next thing is to practice practice, practice the use of safe paths. Um, so if we're already organizing uh, every single project into its own directory, right, and we have an RStudio project file for it, the next thing we can do is to have uh, a relative paths based on that, um, um, on our uh, root directory for the project. And so, um, one of the things here is we might be working with code that uh, some of us will run, let's say, on a Windows computer, and some of us will run, let's say, on a on a Mac computer or Linux. And so uh, R actually has uh, base R functions that um, 
are ad adjust the behavior based on the system. So for example, like file path, um, um, Like that type of command is it's um, much better if you use uh, if you use file path instead of let's say pay zero um, oops. Um, I messed it up. All right. Um, Okay, uh, so this page zero command over here worked for me, right? I got a desktop, desktop forward, forward slash uh, hola, but file.path does that automatically. And if I'm working on a, a computer system that doesn't understand forward slashes that, uh, that uses like back, backward slashes, file.path will automatically adjust the behavior for the operating system. So, uh, so it's best to always use those type of functions uh, than the pacier functions. Um, that's one example there. Um, and so, uh, um, something that will happen to you if you're working in multiple projects, and you definitely will be, um, is that it will be hard for you to remember where your files are unless you're Andrew Jaffe, who had a great memory for that. <laughs> um, and so, um, um, instead of trying to remember where all your files are, um, uh, one way that we can try to do this is by remembering what is a project. And then um, if we use those self-explanatory like file names and stuff, that will help us find the files in the future. Um, so um, here's an example, I guess they sent uh, a little um, stuffed animal all the way over there to the space. Uh, problem is um, um, uh, there were two different versions and like um, uh, they, I guess, didn't send the correct version or something. So. I mean that was a complicated example. I don't I don't know the full story, um, but um, 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 the idea is we want to use two packages of extensively. <clears throat> One of them is the here package, which I've already talked about in the R, um, in the R club sessions, and some of you are already familiar. But we'll just um, double check what that package does. And another one, which I don't think I've mentioned in the past, is the fs package. FS is for like file system. So both of these packages are actually made, I think, by uh, like Jenny Bryan and Jim Hester, the people that made this workshop, uh, or they're definitely involved in them. Um, and so um, here, the idea of the here package is that's going to enable us uh, to have uh, relative paths or project specific, while the FS package is going to help us with like um, um, handling files from R. Um, why do you want to use the FS package if you can just use, let's say, bash commands, for example? Well, um, if you're, uh, if what you're doing involves moving files around, you want to document the steps that you had to do to reproduce the files that you have, the file structure that you have. And at that point, then you want to document um, every step on a code file, uh, on a script file. And so that could be on the R side, or you could actually write a bash script that does this. Um, so um, here are some examples of how we can use the here, here package, right? So one of them is like to say like, okay, we have data. Uh, a data file called raw-data.csv. And this file lives under the data directory. Uh, so uh, the syntax for that would be here, here, here. Uh, we want the file um, 
under the data directory called raw data.csv. And so this is a, a, a great way of working if all of our code and all of our data is centered in a single project directory, right? Um, which is what we want to do. Um, um, then uh, let's say we want to access the home directory um, for a user. Uh, we can either use file.path with the tilde symbol, or we can now use this new uh, FS package that has a function called path underscore home, right? Um, and this package will work for Windows users and uh, Linux and all of that. Um, um, all right. And so um, Jenny, I think here says like she has no you know issues with absolute paths. Like some of her best friends are absolute paths. But um, uh, the idea is that these functions, fs or here here, are going to create those absolute paths in the moment when you run the code, not on your script. Right? And so a good example here is using fs path home. And the output of it is like user Jenny temp test, right? But a bad example here is like uh, hardwiring that path because I, for example, don't have the user Jenny uh, directory in my computer. Um, and so uh, um, if we're working at Gypsy, this might not affect us as much, but, um, uh, but one, reason to think that it, this will be useful is if we need to move the data around in the, in the different disks that we have at Gypsy, right? And so um, let's say we're running out of space in one disk and we need to move one project to another. Um, if all that, if all the code in that project is using here, here, and FS, we can easily move the code to a, a new location without having to spend any time updating uh, absolute paths. Um, uh, otherwise, then we need to update everything. Okay, so uh, the idea of here then is uh, uh, if we're working inside a project, we'll use the here package um, uh, because um, here will always be relative to the project directory. Um, and just like the FS package, it also builds absolute paths at the runtime, at the moment that you evaluate the code. Cool. So this, for example, uh, this is an example that they have where let's say they have a directory called one, inside of it they have a directory called two, and inside of it they have a file called awesome.txt. So the syntax for that would be here, the one folder, the two folder, and then the awesome.txt file, right? Um, um, uh, and like a different scenario would be to like use the site WD command to change the working directory, then uh, then start moving from there. Um, and actually, sorry, this was not the example. This was an example where you, if you change the working directory um, and you still use the here syntax, you get the same file path because it's all based on the on the project. Um, a root. Um, so, um, all right. um, and so as an example of how you can actually use this is if we have our fixed directory where we are saving all our figures uh, and any script where we're creating figures, we can then use, for example, the ggsafe command for saying here, we're going to create a file under the figures directory and this will be the name of our figure, right? Um, and so this will work anywhere. Um, and it works like in, in also it works in our markdown files, git repos, all of that. Um, and uh, this is something that I think we should do for uh, moving on forward, um, this type of structure. Um, um, the here package will recognize multiple structures, but for us, this is all like um, uh, overlapping because We'll have an RC2 project with a Git repo um, in most of our in, in most of our directories. Um, 
an R package that's optional. Uh, uh, sometimes we'll have it. Um, but these two will always have them moving on, uh, right? Because we're, we're, we want to version control our code, we want to share it, and we're using our studio to work with our code. All right. Um, uh, the next thing in this set of slides and tips is that names matter. Um, and remember, we're trying to make, uh, we're trying to use a, a file structure that is going to be self-explanatory as much as possible. And so for that, names are going to be really important. Now, names have to be both machine and human readable. Um, and we also want them to automatically be sorted nicely, right? Um, and so machine readable means that uh, they don't have to have any weird characters. And um, 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 because of how machine works, work like accents and things like that can be complicated um, in names. Uh, but then we also want to us as humans to be able to understand those names. Um, so this is an example here uh, uh, of like, let's say my abstract dot uh, uh, doc X, right? Um, or figure space one dot PNG, right? Or, uh, you know, you could have these other very complicated file that says like delete this and your career is over <laughs> file, right? And so those are not good examples. Uh, good examples are, for example, here, like there's a year, uh, dash, the month, and then uh, 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 underscore, and in this case, it's like the author name, um, dash, what it is about. So this was abstract for our studio conference. All of it is separated by dashes. Um, and there's no spaces there. <laughs> Why are there no spaces? Because sometimes spaces, especially on Windows, make files a little bit not um, computer readable sometimes, um, 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 depending on the tools we use. Uh, this one is like, okay, this one is getting better. Joel's file names are getting better, dot XLS. Uh, but it, it doesn't have a date, for example. So this one is not gonna get automatically sorted nicely. Um, or um, this one is also pretty good because maybe it's like figure zero one, right? And so now we know that that particular file, a scatter plot top length versus interest, is gonna be part of our first figure. Um, and so the best name over here is, is the last one. It's where we have the date dash month dash dash um, day underscore and then separated by dashes all in lowercase than the, what this script is doing and what the raw data is for our uh, own scripts i wouldn't necessarily use the date uh, as part of the file end but i think we 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 do want to uh if i go back to this is slide 50 so let me go back to uh, i think it was like five um, so this example, I think using like um, multiple digits to differentiate like what step the script is doing, that could be quite useful um, in the future for our names, for our script names. Okay. Um, so uh, Jenny Bryan and Jim Hester Carrewo, they define machine readable here as also that um, you can have the names, um, you can um, identify the components of the names using regular expressions. Um, um, and so, uh, like, let's say, for example, for our genotyping project, right? Uh, uh, like this might actually be very useful to have uh, machine readable names that have um, a very specific structure to the name such that, for example, if I go back here, I know that if I separate the name by the underscore, I get on the left side of it, I get a date. And then on the right side of the underscore, I get what the name is about, right? Um, and so 
just from the file name, I, I'm generating, generating data that I can use uh, later on in some of my code, right? Um, so you want to avoid spaces, punctuations, accents, and stuff like that. Um, and the, the delimiters that you use have to have a specific um, purpose, purpose in mind. So like the underscore is only ever used, for example, here to separate the date versus the rest of the file name. So there's only a single underscore, the rest are dashes. Um, right. um, it has to be human readable, right? Because we want to understand what that script or figure or whatever is doing just from reading the name file. Um, and so the concept for this is based on URLs. There's something called a slug, which I mean, here there's a picture of a slug, but that's the right side of it. So in this case, it's like raw data from challenger uh, O-rings, right? And so that text there is something we can understand um, in the future. And you don't need to have like necessarily a readme with a paragraph explaining what that file is, right? Um, and then you want them to sort nicely. And so uh, that's why we put some numbers in the top. Um, you want a left pad with zeros, such, such that you get constant width of the files. Um, and Jenny Bryan recommends this, using this ISO 8601 standard, which is, um, um, which is um, uh, the year, um, dash the month, dash the day. Um, um, and so um, sometimes ordering by day might make sense for some files, right? Um, 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 other times using the 001, 002, et cetera, could be useful, right, for some of our scripts, let's say, uh, some of the logical steps of what we're doing. Um, and so um, the FS package, for example, has uh, a dear underscore ls function. That way we can list all the files, we can read them into R, and then we can, we can start processing them, for example. Um, um, and so there might be different categories too, right, of different files that we have, um, et cetera. And so the idea here is that anyone can like get an idea of what the code is doing. And uh, we can easily filter, for example, let's say we want only the files that have the, the word explore, right? That's a category that we were using. Um, uh, uh, and like we can extract uh, um, the topic. Uh, let's say like, if we, in this case, they had a flavor, right? So comfy, genuine, Spartan, et cetera. Um, um, so you can generate data uh, from the file names. Okay. Um, uh, all right, let me skip that. And so this ISO 8601, Jenny here has a picture of her chicken stock uh, on her freezer. And she says like anyone in the world can understand it because everyone in the world that knows her knows that she uses that ISA standard, right? Which is um, four digits for the year, dash two digits for the month, dash two digits for the day. Um, uh, and I, I use that actually a lot. Uh, for example, I have a directory on my computer um, uh, called um, support. Uh, inside of it, I have a, a folder for every year. And let's see here for geo, uh, for, um, 2020, I have a direct, I use that standard for, to name every single directory. And this for like support requests that I've gotten over the time. And like, I use that same structure, for example, for my talks. Um, so I also have a folder for every year and I use that ISA standard. And so um, this helps me keep my files organized. Uh, I don't use the full syntax of the dashes, uh, of the underscore and dashes, but that you know, maybe something I could change later on. Um, um, okay, so names matter. Uh, uh, and we want all of these properties, machine, human readable, and uh, easily sorted. Um, and the idea is that this will um, 
um, um, it's easy for you to start doing this now. And uh, names are sometimes hard, right? It's choosing names. Um, um, you have to choose that slug, for example, or, or what is the structure of the name that you're going to use. But if you come up with a system, right, um, that is a way, great way to start practicing. And, it, and you're going to evolve that system right, as your project gets more complex. Um, and so this might be something that it could be good to describe on a readme of like, oh, this is a file structure and these are the decisions that I'm going to follow for naming files such that other people can uh, try to name the files using the same structure as you. Um, um, particularly if you're working, you know, two or more people in the same project. Um, we need to be beware of monoliths, which I'm not sure what that is into. Um, oh, yes. I know what that is. <laughs> Sorry, instead of uh, a single thing that does everything, uh, we want to break uh, a very long, complicated script into smaller pieces or a, a complicated function into smaller pieces. And so uh, having, let's say, five different, uh, four different scripts and an R markdown file is like way better than having a single file that does everything inside of it. And so this, this is something that, um, like Louise and I, for example, have been working on one project, right? Where, um, uh, where we're trying to have small, smaller scripts that do one thing uh, instead of a single thing that, um, that if it breaks, it can be hard to debug, right? Um, now, these, four, these file names might be a little bit, um, well, here I guess it chose the names to be kind of, uh, self-explanatory, right? Because there's a test that they're doing, they're wrangling the data, then they're modeling the data, then they're making some figures, and then they're making a report. But uh, we don't always have as clear-cut names as they have here. Um, and that's an area of, uh, of improvement for us. And if you do that, um, if we look at the, um, at the tidyverse um, diagram of how, how to work with data science, uh, the smell that test, for example, is something that will be a script that uh, is between importing and making our data tidy. Uh, Wrangle.R is going to be the a script that like tidies the data and transforms it, transforms it into a way that we can then use. Make figures, for example, will help us visualize the data. Model.R will help us like run the R statistical model. And once we're done with all of the, those phases. Uh, we're going to write like a report for our, to communicate the results to our collaborators. So instead of having a single script that did everything, now we have uh, a lot of small pieces, right? And this actually works uh, quite nicely with like uh, working on multiple projects and resuming, right? Because maybe you're not going to be able to do everything in a single day, right? You're going to be working on on small pieces um, and um, um, that way you can, uh, you, uh, don't get us lost in all the code that you're doing. You're going to have to load less number of packages in each of your scripts and then avoid like conflict issues between our packages and stuff like that. Um, now having a lot of data files is also better than having a single big R data file that does everything. Right. And, um, uh, we've ran into this issue. Um, for example, with some of our genotype data files, it's like we have a very big R data file that has a large matrix of R data files and also a tiny small matrix of uh, the MBS data. And so for some projects with like Arc and Luis, for example, we've, al we've already uh, started separating that big R data file into two small ones, right? Because maybe for some of the things, we only need the small one. We don't need the very big matrix. Um, and so, uh, 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 this is one way of, uh, of improving our workflows. Um, and so you have a lot of small data files uh, or output files. They're going to be, you know, involved in different, of the, in different phases of the project in different steps. Um, so, uh, uh, the idea is also, right, like, each of the each of the scripts that we write 
is going to create a specific types of outputs, right? So like um, the Wrangle R script will take our raw data as input and it's going to create, let's say, a tidy, um, here they're calling that CSV, but I mean, for us, that's never the case. We never have a simple like CSV. We have more complicated file formats, um, but it's going to create like a tidy data that later on we can then use for our statistical modeling, right? And create more files out of it. Um, um, all right. So uh, the whole, the idea is that, uh, that Jamie Bryan, um, Jim Hester, Kara Wu, and other people have been working on is really they, they want to have a humane uh, programming interface API for your analysis. Um, uh, so uh, if we all follow this type of structure, also all of us will be able to you know, help each other faster, understand what uh, our code is doing and, and debug. We're going to make a complicated problem into a, a smaller, less complicated problem, and that's going to help us debug that, uh, that problem in the future. Um, and so um, uh, this is an example that they have where uh, you don't, they, there's a, an exercise that they have here, and they wanted you to, to practice like downloading the data to a specific location um, and stuff like that. Um, 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 all right. um, yeah, so that's, that's that set of slides. They, I mean, they have a challenge here, uh, which we won't do, but that's, um, if you want to practice some of these tools of using FS and here, that would be a good exercise to do. Um, all right. So let me pause the recording and, uh, Right. Um, cool. So uh, we basically finished uh, what was done in like three hours. <laughs> we did it in one hour. <laughs> um, so I mean, they had time to practice and stuff. We didn't have. We didn't spend the time there doing those exercises. Um, the next thing they have is a section on debugging, but debugging is actually um, something that I'm not like fully comfortable uh, doing um, using debugging in R, using the native um, R tools for that. So um, we'll skip this uh, set of slides. Um, um, it, it's useful to learn about it. Um, I just sometimes find it uh, confusing. Um, 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 and sadly, some of the features uh, enabled by RStudio for debugging don't work for us because we're working with um, R on the terminal from RStudio instead of R on the console. Um, so some of the tips that they have on these set of slides don't apply to us um, because of how we work. Um, uh, 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 anyway. Um, a next set of slides they have is um, uh, this is actually only like eight eight slides called read the source. Um, so this is by Jim Hester, and, and uh, I think that's why I end up um, contacting Jim Hester quite a bit myself. He I think knows my name by now because <laughs> uh, I read the source and then ask him questions about the source too. And so, um, uh, <laughs> it's like uh, it's like if you want to be a Jedi, you need to read the source type of thing. So, if you want to have more power. Uh, you're gonna sometimes eventually have to read the source code of uh, of what R package you're using and stuff like that. And so. <clears throat> There's multiple ways of finding the source um, uh, for things. A lot of it is already on GitHub. And so um, this is something that I want to uh, work on um, because a lot of the code that Andrew Jaffe left us is not version control. So it's not something that we can easily search on github.com, right? Um, under the Libre Institute account. 
Um, um, uh, but well, that, that is, uh, that's going to be a, a project that's going to take a bit of time. Uh, now, uh, let's say you're interested in, you know, in just searching in general, um, just github.com forward slash search will, can be a way of searching the source code, um, across like all of GitHub. Um, um, uh, Winston, Winston, uh, Chang, um, I forget what the H is, I guess Chang. Um, uh, he has a mirror of the R source code. This is something that I do not do. Uh, I don't actually read the source code for R. Uh, I've done it a couple of times. It's like, <laughs> it's, um, it's quite confusing. Every single piece of line of code there is, um, has an important meaning sometimes, even though you might not um, see it yourself. And then there's also CRAN, github.com CRAN, which I haven't actually clicked on before. Uh, but I guess this is a way that you can access, it's a mirror, I guess, for all the packages that are on CRAN. Um, let's look at, for example, use this. And so, okay, here it says like, this is a read only mirror. Um, and um, you actually want to see the, the true source. That would be github.com forward slash r dash lib. Um, r-lib is uh, what RStudio uses for organizing their code. Um, um, so that would be one way you want to learn the specifics of use this and how it's implemented. Um, and so um, the code itself, so uh, uh, for example, for R, there's uh, the main C code, there's some R code for, it, for R itself, and then like documentations under the doc manual. And so this can come into play sometimes, you're running into some very, very specific R problems. Um, um, or if you start developing R packages, this is where uh, sometimes reading the source documentation can come into play. Um, so, um, Um, okay. um, so we talked about github.com forward slash cran where we can get a mirrors of a lot of the source files. And this is a lot better than simply downloading um, a tar file with a source from the past. Um, um, now, an R package itself is composed of a couple of key files. There's a description file that has information about who the package uh, was made by and like and some information about what other packages it depends on. It might be a readme. The R directory, that's where all the R code is. The MAN directory is where all the manual information is or all the documentation. Um, um, SRC is for the source. If you have any uh, C or Fortran code in your package, and vignettes is where all the documentation is. Um, so um, this will come into play if you're working with some of the back and the latest packages. Um, and uh, but that's something that if you you know if you run into the situation, we can go over in more detail about how to how to read the source of a particular package and how to use that information to help you figure out if if there's a bug in the package um, or if you need some help with a specific portion of it. Um, so this is really like, I would say like advanced use of R um, or super advanced use. All right. So, um, let's go back to, all right. So that was debugging, and uh, we skipped a lot of it, uh, but we'll, we'll get back to it later. So I'm gonna now look at Git and GitHub. Um, and so, uh, everyone here, I think, already uses Git and GitHub. Um, uh, but these are some useful slides, let's say you wanna explain some of these concepts to people. Um, uh, 
And there's also concepts here that, are, that get maybe a bit more complicated than what we need for our purposes. Um, but um, so we might not necessarily uh, dive into those. So um, Jenny Bryan, she actually has a very famous website called happygitwithr.com, uh, which is about um, how to be a happy Git and GitHub user um, that also uses R. And we've referred to this website quite a bit in the past. Um, and uh, and um, a lot of it is like, how do we actually install Git? How do you install, um, uh, like let's say Git Bash on Windows to make sure that it plays well with R and R Studio? Um, uh, how do you create your account and things like that? How do you set up your SSH keys? And so we've already have videos on this uh, from the R Club and from um, some of our training sessions with some of you in the past. Um, so I won't dive as much into this book now. Um, but that's a resource we can use for guiding on people. Uh, we'll have, you know, want to use Git. Uh, so uh, I don't actually know what they were showing with this image. <laughs> but you can see a human evolving, and then there's a machine evolving with a human, and then they become one, I guess. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, my Zoom window is getting on the way. Um, uh, so, uh, all right, so a commit here, they're saying is like, it's a project state. You're saving, you're, uh, you're making a safe point for a project state. And, um, and that, um, uh, point in time that you're, uh, saving for future reference will be useful if you want to check it out later. So that's inspected, or if you want to compare. Uh, you know, state of, of the past versus the present. Or let's say you decide you actually want to go back in time, then you can restore the past. We don't actually do much of the going back in time uh, portion, um, but that's something that can be done. Um, uh, the difference between one state and the next uh, uh, is called um, diff for difference. Um, and so that you know is the delta of like what has changed between one uh, state and the next state, and so we can ask what changed there and why did it change. Um, what's changed there? That is like we can just see the differences between the two, let's say, R scripts, right? And we can see what is actually different there. But why did it change? That's where the commit message will come into play, because that's where we're, we're going to describe describe for ourselves and other people why we made some changes and so these are a set of images so that explain how to use Git and like version control and stuff i just find that quite complicated um, um, but um, um, i guess here the concept that they're trying to show you is that instead of having like an aries uh, file r script that has five or more different versions, you can have a single version. And so we have collaborators that actually generate all these like five or six different files. And like, um, like Arth and I are trying to help someone that did that. And it's really confusing for us because we don't know what's the correct file that we should be looking at, right? Um, and so debugging and helping other people when they have a ton of files is, uh, can be quite complicated. Um, um, and if you're working with multiple people, then everyone is like, eh, which is the file that we're supposed to be working on, right? Um, so Git and version control will help all of that. Um, and it enables a way for collaborating, which is like involves two keywords, the push and the pull. Push is when you share to, uh, um, uh, to a remote location. And normally that is this, um, 
this little symbol that you see over here is a cat with like an octopus mix. That is the that is the mascot for GitHub. Um, let me just uh, I'll point you that image. Um, it's called the Octocat. Uh, and so there you can see that, you know, it's like a little cat with like uh, octopus legs type of thing. <laughs> um, okay. So let's say I'm working on something and I made some changes. I want to share them with other people. I'm going to push them to GitHub. And then let's say, uh, let's say Maddie is going to work with those changes later. She can pull them. And uh, that, that means she can download them, right? So it's upload and download type of thing, push and pull. Um, and so <clears throat> um, there's actually a paper that we might also be interested in looking at. This, I think, was made by Kara Wu and Jenny Bryan, I think. Uh, let's see if I remember. Oh, only Jenny Bryan, sorry. Um, so this is a paper where she explains uh, why we should use, be using Git, what it is, and stuff like that. And so, uh, actually, I can see some of the same images from these slides here in this paper. Um, um, and so that, you know, that could be good to read later on um, and to be more familiar with, like, why we want to be using Git, especially if we're trying to convince other people about it. Um, so we can have more arguments ready um, um, to show them why this is useful. Okay, uh, from GitHub actually, you can get a user interface, um, a web site. So actually, I use this a lot, right? That's how like, um, like just the book that I'm writing, right? That's the website, a user interface for some code that is version controlled through GitHub. Um, um, and so a lot of this is detailed in this Happy Git with R book that Jenny Bryan wrote with other people. Uh, um, and so why do we want a version control? The idea is that you want to feel free to experiment without uh, being afraid. Uh, you want to compare um, uh, what is the difference after you made a change. Um, but something that is really hard for, I think, all of us uh, in the team is to embrace incrementalism, right? Um, a lot of us, we want to just share our code once we have a final version, right? Um, uh, but uh, so there's a very strong resistance towards incrementalism, right? Which is just showing small, tiny updates, right? But um, the small tiny updates uh, help us understand better the cause and effect, right? And um, and also document our the why, right? Why we're doing this, the commit messages. Um, so I encourage all of you to to just make um, as many commits as you want. Um, 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 Commits are cheap, right? Um, so um, this is a hard one, and it, like everyone needs practice. Um, and um, uh, otherwise, you're going to run into examples where like you have a, a lot of changes, and then uh, identifying the cause and effect uh, will be really hard, right? Uh, like the source of a bug, let's say. Um, you also want to collaborate. So if you're working with others, that's also going to push you to, to, to share your code more frequently. And finally, we're going to expose our work, right? Because we're going to share our code to the rest of the world. And this is something that scares everyone, right? And that's why I think incrementalism and exposing your work are a bit, uh, are a bit odd sometimes because people want to share only like their best work sometimes, right? Um, but um, uh, in the end, it will be our best work, right? We'll, we'll share the, the, the latest versions of our scripts and stuff. It's just that uh, for the rest of the team, showing, seeing all those small differences is going to help us understand um, what went on in the project. Now, Git is complicated, 
answer uh, this healthcare profile. Uh, uh, and it's gonna show you some error messages and you'll be like, what? I have no idea what just happened. Um, and then, so you'll feel like this all the time. And <laughs> I see some of you smiling. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've all felt this. And like, you're gonna feel it with like two hands too. <laughs> uh, uh, um, um, and I guess there's this quote from Carl Sagan, if you wanna make an apple pie from scratch, you first have to invert the universe because yeah, I mean, there's no apples. There's no pies, there's no concept of pie. Um, all of that. So that is like a ton of work. And I guess an apple pie is something that you can make uh, through a recipe. Um, all right, so Jenny Bryan has thought a lot about like, the pains of Git, um, but then uh, the benefits of it. And so there's a balance between agony and flow. Um, um, so just using Git by itself can be quite painful, but using GitHub plus, let's say, this icon over here is uh, the icon for an app called Source Tree, um, and then our studio. All of those, if you use all three of them, then maybe you'll have a better experience. Um, so let me um, uh, show you source tree. Um, I, I like using source tree myself. Um, sometimes when I need to deal with something more complicated, I don't get it. Um, um, right. So yeah, just using the terminal um, and interacting with Git on the terminal might be really painful. You use all three of these tools on the right side and um, it might be less painful and so things might flow better. Um, so. There's some steps you can take for agony reduction. Uh, you can first use a Git client if you like. Uh, and that's because like here, uh, Jennifer, uh, like, um, you know, um, a really, uh, Jenny Bryan really uh, um, expands on this. Like there's no hardcore Git near patches, right? It's not like you get like uh, a diploma that says like, oh, you suffered through Git terminal for 20 years you are um, the champion of the world or something. There's nothing like that. Um, and so she recommends here Git Kraken. I haven't used Git Kraken. I don't know if any of you have, um, um, but that could be something to explore. Um, um, I just mentioned uh, source tree. So let's look at Git Kraken just quickly. Um, I use Git Kraken, it's pretty good. Cool. Um, I, I like the, the dark background stuff. Um, it looks like a similar to source tree in some ways. Um, now this history looks really complicated there. I get how history, <laughs> get history. Uh, but yeah, um, so Git Kraken, uh, uh, source tree, some of those tools will be useful. Um, okay, so <clears throat> I'm not sure what this slide is showing. Um, I can see there's GitHub on the top and your computer. Um, okay, I don't I don't understand that in slide. Uh, uh, then. Something that gets really tricky when you're understanding GitHub is a yours or theirs uh, syntax. So that means, um, uh, that normally means like a clone that you're downloading. Um, but uh, it could also, like you were referring to branches and stuff, that could also uh, be your branch versus their, their branch and stuff like that. Um, so some of that syntax gets complicated. Um, and so 
Here, Jenny crossed out theirs because we're not going to be working with branches. Um, that's where you start to get um, complicated, into co more complicated scenarios. Um, so um, let's say you want to download stuff from, from the web, from GitHub. The process of downloading something is cloning. You're making a copy of that. Um, and once you have a clone on your computer, uh, you can um, uh, push to GitHub or pull, right? Um, and so we'll be doing this quite a bit. Uh, and you, like in this icon, we have uh, the computer, but it could also be Gypsy, for example, right? Where you're pushing and, and pulling daily from um, GitHub. Um, and so now I understand the icon, the not your problem part is whatever they do on their computers, right? Your collaborators or whatever. It's up to them to figure that out. Um, okay. You can also download a copy that they have on the web. Um, and well, I guess uh, there's some scenario screen for Jenny saying it's not as useful as you think. Um, you can also make a copy of what someone else has on the web on GitHub that is forking. Um, and we don't actually use this much uh, for our own. Um, work at Libre, uh, but this is useful if you're interacting with other R package authors on the web uh, and you're debugging some of their code. And typically what you'll do if you're working with code from someone else on the web is that you will actually fork it and then download it to your computer. So you'll make a copy of it on the web that's forking and then you'll download it to your computer that's cloning. So you'll do both steps at times. Um, and you can change the directions of the arrows too, right? So you can make it such that you can pull directly from code from someone else on the web, and then you can push or upload to your own copy of the code on the web. And then from your copy of the code on the web, you can send it to someone else to their copy using the pull request process. So all of, all of these slides are useful for understanding some of the, the terminology. Um, um, but really what we're mostly gonna do is pushing and pulling from our own copy on the web. Um, uh, and so if we're starting a project, we'll always like create an R Studio project. We'll like uh, use this create project. And then immediately after that, we'll set up um, GitHub for our project. And that way from the very beginning, we'll have the full code history. Um, and so, Remotes and branches are not really explained by Jenny Ryan. And that's because uh, we, she says like here, we're, we wanna learn how to bake pies uh, before messing with everything else, right? And I know some of you are comfortable using remotes or branches, um, but um, uh, it's just added complexity that we don't need at this point for most of our projects. Um, and so, um, again, we're gonna start with like a, a directory, let's our main directory. So in this case, as an example, she has packages-report. And that will be um, where we're gonna save our studio, our, our studio project and our GitHub. Um, is, that's where we're gonna initialize our GitHub re repository. And so this was a question that Luis asked earlier today. Um, Okay. Um, so let's say you make a project and the GitHub file that uh, you start version controlling, then here there's a, they did an exercise where they created a file, did something to it, version controlled it. Um, and then uh, uh, they learned about what is the diff stage, uh, 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 comparing differences with, uh, and then saving differences on uh, through staging, um, then actually saving a state through the commit command, uploading the code through the push command. Um, so I won't go into those details because uh, all of you have done this uh, already too. Um, okay. Um, there's also sometimes a difference between what we write. So uh, on our file, or an ARP markdown file and what people see, right? Um, or what they need to read. 
Um, and so that's where we might use, let's say, uh, uh, our markdown render to generate a specific report based on a, on a given input file. Um, uh, and so we can actually generate, let's say, HTML file outputs. And that's a great way because um, those HTML file outputs, we can then uh, upload them to GitHub. Um, um, and so this is where we'll use like, uh, um, um, uh, our markdown for all of this. And so there's a lot of different types of outputs. So you can make an HTML output. Uh, you can keep the markdown, for example. You can directly say you want to just say a, a markdown document. So actually, I haven't used this myself. I don't know if any of you have used this, but you can actually go from a .r file to a .nd file. Um, um, so that's, um, that could be quite useful. Or maybe you want to create a GitHub document. This is something I have definitely done where I create um, a readme.nd using R as code. Um, okay. Um, so, um, okay. Something Jenny here uh, wants us to remember is that, um, and uh, Jenny, Kara, and, and um, Jim, is that uh, all the output files, all those HTML files, if we put them on GitHub, then people can easily uh, uh, see them too um, on the web. Um, uh, and that's because um, it's easier for people to see the finished output, right? They don't want to run uh, your code from scratch. So we just show them an HTML file. And that's, for example, something that Josh is working on with other people, and I think Luis. Um, and Nick Eagles are uh, like um, just generating some HTML files that show how to do some specific analysis um, using the speakeasy in particular. Um, um, uh, and uh, if you just want to show stuff directly on GitHub, MD files, markdown files, might be better than other file formats like .docx, .pdf, .html. Uh, um, now, uh, .x and .pdf, those are binary files, so they're not text files, and so they're harder to version control. Um, so that is something you have to be you know, mindful of um, if you're going to be documenting um, stuff that takes a lot of time to run um, uh, or that you're going to change a lot. That's not going to be very uh, stable. Um, um, okay. uh, now, there's a chapter on the Happy Git with R about making your GitHub repository browsable. And I think this also has to do a lot with our file organization, right? Um, and so, uh, that is probably a chapter that we can look into later in the future. Um, um, so let's say you're working with files that generate uh, output um, files. Um, let, um, if you make a meaningful change, they want you to you know, make the new output files so can, you can see the main differences. Uh, but this is something that um, is moving. Um, away from uh, being a manual thing to being more of an automatic step um, uh, using GitHub Actions. So that's something that I'll uh, mention more on the, on, on, on the book. Um, um, like I'll mention more about GitHub Actions and like how to contribute and stuff. Um, once in, I'll do this in the future, but uh, uh, the idea is to uh, avoid having to do the rendering or the automatic updating um, uh, ourselves um, um, and then just use a machine, uh, uh, a boring machine to do it for us. All right. Um, so that's, I think, basically it. Um, uh, there's some more details about like uh, configuring your GitHub and stuff like 
uh, using, for example, the GitHub path environment variable, uh, um, which some of you have to use for some of our code. Um, uh, there's also this uh, fun things. Use this has some functions for like creating a pull request, for pushing, for example, uh, for creating a, the, um, a, a package, uh, sorry, an RStudio, um, an RStudio um, project from some files that live on GitHub, for example. But all these commands, I don't think you'll use them as much. Um, uh, I mean, particularly the create one, I don't think you'll use that one as much. Maybe some of these other ones you will um, um, dive into them uh, for some scenarios. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, there's a bit more stuff, but I think that's the end, really. Um, so let me stop recording. Mm -hmm.